So. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, wait. This is not uncomfortable, but it's very weird. This is the thing? This is the one. Absolutely. And now it almost couldn't have happened in a better way. Where did you want to be? So it was just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> am I funny? Now if I go over here, am I still funny? Better strategy. Yeah, way better strategy. I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah. it's a work. I don't see it five years from now that you're not my most famous friend. You really have to commit to something. Good to have something pushing you. That's that cool. That was really cool. Yeah, it might be cool. This is On The Cusp. Hello, I'm Ben Green and welcome to On The Cusp. This week my guest is Tim Neenan. He's a sketch teacher at the UCB Theater in LA. One of the members of the UCB mod team, New Money, and he's written for shows like Newsreaders, The Onion News Network, and Filthy Sexy Teens. I'm not sure how you're listening to On the Cusp right now, but you should know that there are a lot of ways to listen to it. You can find the show on Stitcher, on SoundCloud, and on iTunes. And I hope you'll subscribe to the show on one of those sites. This week's episode is sponsored by Thai Pepper at 6219 Franklin Avenue in Los Angeles. If you haven't been to Thai Pepper before, now's the perfect time to come sample some of their famous pineapple fried rice for $6.90. And while you're chowing down, don't forget to use hashtag more Thai Pepper, please, on Twitter, the only official hashtag of Thai Pepper for summer 2015. Thai Pepper, just like the Beatles said it, hello, hello, I don't know why you say good Thai, I say Thai Pepper. So when I got on the sketch team New Money, Back at the beginning of 2013, Tim Neenan was one of the only people on the team that I knew pretty well from before getting on the team. We were both part of the very late night improv show Mock Improv at the time, and that was largely the slice of the world that I knew Tim from. I knew him as an improviser. But when I got on New Money, I saw another side of Tim for the first time. I realized that Tim is kind of the glue that holds New Money together. And it was really amazing to discover this whole group of people who saw him that way. I think it's because his passion for the team is so obvious. And he goes way farther than he needs to with everything he does for the team. Like, it's already a lot that he makes the tech CDs for every show. But if you look at his Instagram, you'll see that he also hand draws a cover for every CD that matches the theme of that month's show. He's the member of the team that's edited the videos for all of our shows and put every sketch on YouTube in a perfect catalog. He's the reason we have an operating website, and I could go on and on with examples like this. You know, Tim once wrote a sketch about a fictional video game called Diaper Strike. He said he thought it would be cool if some footage from the made-up game played at the end of the sketch, and for most people, that thought would end there. They would never do anything with it. But Tim stayed up late and figured out how to actually make that animation, and it ended up looking incredible. That's the kind of thing Tim does all the time and what helps to keep his fellow teammates on New Money inspired. So I'm very excited to share this interview with you guys. My talk with the one and only Tim Neenan. Here it is. From yesterday, so I get what standing in the shade. Something's wrong with my depth perception, so I Walk in place till I reach a destination. So you were up till 4 a.m. last night watching the movie Babadook. Mm -hmm. How typical is that, that you're kind of like a night owl? Uh... Very. I do. I, I stay up very late. Like I'll stay up till dawn a lot and it's not good. Cause I also then don't sleep all day. I will have to go do something at like nine or 10 in the morning. <laughs> uh, and so, um, <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> so do you very typically get like five hours of sleep? Uh, yeah, I would say, well, no, uh, I think unfortunately, like I have no, I couldn't tell you what my sleep schedule is like it's either five or if I don't have anything that day like I will sleep till noon or something having gone to bed at five in the morning um so it's very erratic and I, I think it makes me unhealthy maybe when did that start um I think when I moved to LA uh a little bit after I moved to LA um I guess the <laughs> we're gonna jump right into it like my sleep went to shit like after uh, 
I don't think I, I think the sleep schedule has been like a weird side effect of uh, uh, some grief. Like I lost my brother and then I like wasn't sleeping at all after that for a long time. And I don't think it's really tied to that anymore. I think my body like just started assuming like, oh, there's no predictable uh, uh, sleep schedule coming for, for me at all anymore. Uh, and I only think that might be the reason because uh, my dad describes the same thing. He just doesn't sleep anymore. Uh, and he absolutely thinks it's like still tied to that because he is uh, dealing, I mean, he's a parent, so it's different. Um, but yeah, he still has a hard time with it. Um, and my sister, same thing. She's got like a weird sleep schedule. Uh, uh, so I should probably fix it at some point. See <laughs> like somebody a doctor? About it. Yeah, like I should address it, but I don't have insurance yet. <laughs> How did you lose your brother? Uh, he was in, uh, I lost two. One was in Afghanistan uh, in 2010, and uh, two years before that, I believe, uh, my stepbrother, uh, I lost him to a, a drunk driver. Those are two terrible ways. Uh, yeah, it was a rough couple of years for sure. Um, 2008, yeah, I think it was two years because I lost Jeremy, the stepbrother, right before I moved. Uh, and Brendan, uh, my uh, biological brother, uh, uh, right after I moved. And is your staying up late still like connected to grieving? No, not at all. That's why, yeah, that I, I really think I formed the habit as a result. And so like it's, I would bet a million dollars it's 100% fixable at this point. Okay. And I just haven't gone to a sleep specialist or just gotten some, I don't know. I'm also very like uh, uh, phobic about medication. Like I don't even really like taking aspirin. Um, I don't know what that's all about. But like I, I really just like don't like doing it. And I, I would hate to like have to be prescribe something like if it turns out I need Ambien I'd be very bummed out and probably wouldn't take it uh uh because I don't know why I have no answer for <laughs> why that is uh well we'll talk about uh more about what we've just talked about later okay <laughs> um, but you were born in Alabama yes uh, and what town in Alabama? Uh, I'm from Enterprise, uh, which is adjacent to Fort Rucker, which is the Army's uh, helicopter flight school. Uh, so I was actually born on Fort Rucker because when I was born, my dad was but a uh, pilot. And um, now he teaches flight school. So, um, yeah, born in the, the town that is sort of next to it and feeds off it, and, and they have this kind of symbiotic relationship, the base in that small town. Um, uh, uh, born there uh, until I was two or three, and then we moved around a lot, uh, as Army families do. Um, but I'm still like very much from Enterprise, Alabama, because uh, when my dad became a, a flight instructor, uh, there's only one place to do that, and that's an enterprise. Uh, so he uh, was stationed there when I was in th the tail end of third grade, almost fourth grade, and I've been there. I had been I've been there until I moved to LA, um, which was a nice experience because I didn't have to move around in high school and junior high like so many kids I knew did. What does it mean that your dad was a pilot and a pilot in the army? Mm -hmm. So, what was that job like? Uh, I don't know. I wish I knew more, I guess. I mean, I know he flies helicopters. Uh, uh, I, but he's, like, seen action? Uh, uh, very little from what he has told me. Like, I know that there was, a, like, the closest it ever came. Like, he was not in any major war in our time. Uh, but he, um, he does have a story about getting his, uh, like, so below your feet is glass called the chin bubble. Uh, and you can see straight down. And his chin bubble was shot out by, uh, 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 you know, the guys growing uh, whatever poppy seed, whatever they make drugs out of in Panama. Uh, really? He, he was, like, flying over that. Because, uh, I, I, again, I'm making a lot of this up. I don't know what his job was. But there was some form of, as there is in Afghanistan now, there was some form of uh, policing of the drug trade in Panama uh, that I'm sure he was... Uh, had to fly some missions for and uh, I'm sure those guys growing whatever did not like that and uh, shot at him but I think that was like that's as scary as he's ever told me it got yeah, there could be things he's just never told me about he, does he love flying? he still does it he retired officially from the army in 2000 and he is still doing it as a contractor in 2015 and like 
I think we'll just keep doing it until they ground him on <laughs> on, on physical, like, like you don't pass the physical anymore, you're very old. Uh, <laughs> which is, who knows, 20 years away, I don't know. He loves it. He, I think that's, I took a lot from my dad. He was a very good dad, but the one of the biggest takeaways, like just watching him as a kid, was seeing uh, someone love their job and to chase that because uh, he loves going to work. He's still he's a teacher and he loves that aspect about his job. I think um, I think he's always loved his job, but you can tell like he extra loves going to teach flight school and dealing with. 20, you know, 20 year olds, uh, uh, who have just decided they're going to fly helicopters. Um, he loves it. Yeah. That's great. And what did your mom do? Uh, like as you were traveling around, uh, my mom was, uh, at home, I guess she raised us, uh, the army like requires that he was at work a lot. And so, yeah, somebody needed to be around. Uh, she worked briefly. I remember when we were stationed in Korea, uh, she got like an office job, uh, I'm sure, just to like keep her sane a little bit. <laughs> uh, and we had um, uh, uh, a woman named Mrs. Che who would stay at the house with us and, and cook us Korean food while my mom was at work. Um, but then when we were stationed in Panama, she was at home uh, uh, just raising us. Um, and then uh, she was diagnosed with cancer like at the tail end of our time in Panama. And they, um, the army was like really great about it because uh, also in Alabama is this really incredible cancer research uh, hospital in Birmingham, uh, and they were like, uh, it was really, it was like everything aligned. They were like, well, Hugh can go to Rucker and he's going to be a flight school instructor, and that allows him to be stationed in Alabama permanently, and his wife can be treated at, at UAB. And so, yeah, like for that, so we moved back to Enterprise. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, yeah, it was like until 1998, just uh, like her, she was being treated for it until she passed. She was diagnosed at what point? What year? 93 or 94? 93, because I was, yeah, in the tail end of third grade. And how would you consider yourself as having like a happy childhood up to her diagnosis, and how did her diagnosis affect you after that? Um, happy, yeah, for sure. Like I was, uh, uh, it was I was so young, like eight years old. Like, yeah, I remember being happy, uh, um, as happy as like any eight year old kid. Yeah, the, the, my parents' marriage was good, and uh, uh, so there was no like internal strife that way, uh, and. Yeah, I think, like, her being so sick, because, like, they they did not give her very long, and, like, she really did, like, aggressively pursue, like, every possible avenue, and it was never because she... Th I don't think it was ever because she talked like she was going to beat it. Uh, she would say, like, out loud that, like, she just wanted to get to my sister starting kindergarten, uh, which was five years out. Uh, and she did it. She like died like right after Katie started kindergarten. Uh, but it was, uh, it's tough to watch somebody like f in retrospect, like, I don't think I realized it cause you're a kid. And like, that was just, it's weird to be a kid. And like the default is just, yeah, my mom's sick. Like, it's not weird to you it made every, like my friends uncomfortable if they came over. And so no one wanted to come to my house cause I had a very sick mother in like bed in her room. But like it's 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 funny like what you just adjust to and you're like that's that's regular life, um, but yeah in retrospect it's brutal to see somebody fight like a cancer that's fully winning uh, and just hanging on no matter what, uh, uh, and I think that might have like made me a weird kid a little bit like I was definitely a weirdo and <laughs> how are you uh, weird? Uh, it was tough to like be friends with me like I think I was just like in general annoying. And I think there was, like, kind of, even if I wasn't consciousness of it, there was definitely, like, just this cloud of sadness at home uh, for me and my brother and my sister. And uh, I, I don't, I, yeah, I, I guess I couldn't, in, like, intelligently say, like, why that made me weird. But, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was tough to make friends. I could tell, like, I've always been pretty aware when somebody, like, doesn't want to talk to me. <laughs> I actually like that about myself. I can tell when somebody, like, if I'm 
at a party or something and I'm clearly, oh, this person doesn't want to be talking to me. I'm going <laughs> to let them go. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very like scared of being that person you're trapped in a conversation with, maybe to a fault. Um, and I knew that as a little kid. Like, I knew that people thought I was annoying. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I don't know. I think I just, like, tried to be very, like, silly and class clowny, like, in the wrong way. Like, in a way that I was, like, just trying to get attention and stuff because there wasn't a lot at home. There was too much stuff to do and and treatment going on. And uh, my dad at work and my mom, like, barely able to communicate at some points. And uh, so, that, so then it fell on me to, like, sort of watch my younger brother and sister after school and stuff and parent them a little bit. Uh, uh, and I, yeah, I think that just made me, like, <laughs> try to be very big outside of home. Um, any stories that speak well to how it sucked having a mom that was sick <laughs> at, growing up? Yeah, it's funny because, like, any sad story I have about it, like, or just a story that, like, speaks to, like, what it was like to grow up with a sick mom, yeah, it's all kind of in retrospect. Like, you, like I said, like, you, it all just becomes, like, what life is like if you've got a sick mother or like a sick wife or whatever you uh like that just becomes your default um so it wasn't like overwhelmingly sad as a kid uh it was it's it's all in retrospect like thinking like what a weird childhood i guess that was so yeah like it, and most of it just makes me feel terrible like the yeah uh so when she uh when you know other forms weren't working or it was becoming more aggressive she uh, decided, all right, we got to, we got to go full macrobiotic diet, uh, which is just lots of like brown rice and, and, and beans and stuff. Um, and I remember like me and my brother just like bitching incessantly about it. Like she'd serve dinner and we'd be like, Oh, like, I hate this stuff. Like really just being awful children. Uh, and she would have to be like, I under, I know, I know, but like, this is for me. Like, this is, this is like for treatment. And like, they're, they're saying right now that like, this is like, this, uh, can help people who are or possibly treat cancer. If you, if you go full macrobiotic, uh, and we're like fourth and first graders, like we didn't, we just wanted macaroni and cheese. <laughs> and that's horrible in retrospect. Like I understand it. I understand that we were just dumb kids who didn't want to eat bland brown rice, uh, but I'm more, yeah, it makes you feel bad because you think of what that must have been like for her <laughs> to have to serve her kids, like, her bad cancer food. <laughs> um, and, yeah, there was this time where we were, like, driving down to, uh, uh, Florida, I think, uh, to visit my grandmother, and, um, there, yeah, like, uh, she, if you drove for long distances with her, the, the chemo, uh, would make her vomit, uh, uh, kind of regularly. And so we would have to pull over and she'd have to like throw up on the side of the road. And, uh, again, at the time it was like, yeah, this is like, this is how, like we have to drive with mom and it's not a big deal. Uh, and I think it got so bad on that trip that we ended up having to pull over and get a hotel. And the hotel was like across from Disney or Universal Studios or something. <laughs> yeah. And again, we were little kids who had never been, and we were like pushing our noses against the glass like orphans looking at like food in a window or something and asking if we could just go, can we go like just for a little bit in the morning? And the answer was of course no. And we didn't know at the time that we were pulled over in this hotel because my mother was sick. Uh, we thought like my dad had cruelly picked a hotel from like across the theme park. And he still says like, that story has like come up like in the last couple of years or something. And he still says like, that was a very hard moment as a parent for him. Uh, it just made him feel terrible. And I'm sure it made it made her feel terrible. So what were your main activities like in middle school and high school? Like the things you liked doing? Uh, it took me a, a while to find one because, um, yeah, I was, uh, never sure like if I was in good standing with like any group of kids uh and and like wanted to be liked and and was weird and and definitely like post my mom dying like I was that kid in school who everyone sort of felt bad for because they definitely like tell everyone um so I tried 
a lot of different ones. Like seventh grade is like when junior high started for us. And that's where you have to do extracurriculars. Um, before that, like elementary is just all the core stuff. So seventh grade, I did drama and like was in plays. Um, and then eighth grade, I took art and, um, out of sort of desperation of not like having any <laughs> other like options. I didn't like, I played piano a little bit and you couldn't play piano in marching band. Um, so like I couldn't do that. Um, and yeah, I ended up like sort of just taking art on a lark and did not like it very much. Um, and couldn't draw at all. So like, I, just <laughs> so you're I good, felt like I you're was a good like, drawer now. Uh, I don't know. I've seen you like on your iPad, uh, doing things that look good, but I guess that's, you know how to like use Photoshop very well, is that, which is maybe a different thing. That's a big thing. Yeah. I, I guess I can, yeah. Uh, I can't like freehand draw very well okay. in a way that like Barrick hardly can, but yes, I can manipulate like, uh, Photoshop pretty well, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah, eighth grade was definitely, I remember eighth grade in particular was kind of this, um, that was the year my mom died, maybe coincidentally. I don't even know if I've ever thought of this and put this together, but like, that limbo year where I had no activities and didn't know like which, like who was really like my good friends or anything, uh, was that year. That was the same year I took art with like a bunch of strange kids I'd never hung out with before and was like very, I remember being very jealous of the kids who were in marching band, uh, who had started in seventh grade, uh, and the kids, um, like on even on just like yearbook, like kids who had like a thing they really enjoyed doing for their elective. And then my friends, uh, so in ninth grade, my friend Michael uh, convinced me to join the show choir. Um, uh, he was like, it's like there's, it's all girls and like it's super fun and you just like sing and like screw around all day. It's awesome. Um, and I said, sure. I, I didn't even like, I just blindly followed him and do an activity hoping that would stick. Um, and uh, it was kind of fun. Like it was, I liked all the road trips. Like you got to go on lots of like trips to show choir competitions. Um, uh, but I was a little bit of like a lazy show choir. Like if you've ever seen a show choir, like all the dancing is very, like it pops and is very precise and you're like moving into very specific positions. Uh, and I was definitely the kid with sort of like noodly arms who was like lazily going through the motions <laughs> and like, talk singing because I knew I was with 50 other kids and like, they're not going to know if I'm really singing or not. <laughs> yeah. I was just doing it to like hang out with my friend, Michael, uh, <laughs> and, uh, like be surrounded like in girls in like bright red show choir lipstick. <laughs> um, and did not enjoy it enough to like even audition for like the high school show choir. Uh, and I remember, like, when ninth grade ended, like, all the girls, like, standing in the hallway looking at the poster that said whether or not they'd gotten into the high school show choir and, like, screaming with, like, real tears coming down their faces if they didn't get it. Or oh. if they did get it. Like, I, that was, like, <laughs> I think that was maybe the first time. And we see that now, like, with auditioning and stuff. Like, uh, it's maybe not screaming and crying, but, like, I feel like that exact emotion is inside if you're not showing it on the outside. <laughs> Uh, that was like my first like peek at what that looks like to like care about something that much and like to have it not somewhat in your power based on talent, but to have somebody on the other end just say like, nope, you don't get this. Like for the next year, uh, you will not be on this thing that you worked really hard to be on. Um, <coughs> so yeah, uh, we had a weird school system where seventh grade was all one school. Eighth and ninth grade was its own school. And then high school was 10, 11 and 12. Um, the reason for that being they had lots of extra buildings from pre-integration. Uh, oh, and so they <laughs> <how nice. laughs> uh, split uh, the school up to take, to take advantage of like the old black high school, um, uh, which is both sad and also good because you see like, oh, phew, we did it. We made progress <laughs> and recycled this like sad history. Um, so yes, then going into high school, like I finally found it. And my, my friend Mark and Randy uh, uh, this friend that got me into, um, choir, like we sort of like s just slowly weren't as good friends anymore. Like for no reason, he just like got into different stuff than I did, which happens when you're in junior high. And like, he went off to like do the rifle team, I think. Uh, and, uh, my friends Mark and like, a, a 
had introduced me to this like kid Randy who like is now one of my best friends uh, in the world um, as is Mark uh, and they were both doing band and I was like well I don't play any horns or anything like I would love to get to hang out with you guys all day because they had like grown to be like Mark specifically had, like grown to be my best friend at this point uh, and I would love to yeah like be in band and they introduced me to the drumline guy and he was like oh if you play piano you can be on the drumline uh, we have like mallet instruments and marimbas and xylophones and stuff and uh, uh, he spent like an afternoon with me showing me how to play those. Uh, and I knew how to read music. So I knew rhythm and could also like work the timpani and some of like the background percussion and stuff and had no idea I could, uh, do that. Uh, I, I didn't know that like, uh, there were elements of like music ability that you could transfer to other instruments. I thought I just played piano. And then I was like, oh my God, I play like nine instruments and didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, and then high school, like now it was fun. Like now I was in a thing that I loved doing and like the group I like for the first time ever, like my group of friends, like liked me <laughs> and, uh, it felt like I was on equal like footing and, and good standing with the group of friends I hang out with where I was always like the sort of annoying one before that. Um, and oh my God, it was so exciting. Like the first band practice I went to I, I was like my like heart was beating I was having such a good time and thought this was so cool and I had this like loud drum instructor who like yelled at you when you didn't get st like who was a good teacher but absolutely like that sort of whiplashy like why are you not getting this and I loved it like I was like yes more please like <laughs> uh, uh, it was really really fun and so I did marching and symphonic band like all through high school um and, and while there, like, learned how to play other instruments and, like, uh, got to go on, like, awesome band trips. And, like, I, I did this thing called Indoor Drumline, which is, like, this sort of um, stomp-y kind of program uh, that, like, is a national program. And you get to go to Ohio to do, like, the final, uh, you know, we went to, like, the World Championships in Ohio as part of Indoor Drumline, which was, like, a you know, off, it was the off season of marching band indoor and it's all percussion and mallets and no horns or anything. And like, there's dancers and choreography and you put together like basically what amounts to like a stage show you might see in Vegas, uh, at the high school level. <laughs> um, and like, those are like all my favorite high school memories is doing indoor drumline. Um, and like my dad got super involved with it and like wanted to drive the band truck whenever we did, uh, trips and so like my dad and Mark my best friend his dad uh, who was also like in the army uh, our dads were also friends and so it was very fun to like watch my dad and Mark's dad like be the two dads that ended up driving the band truck and they would like uh, they drove like looking back like my dad drove this immense like carrier truck full of uh heavy, heavy drums and mallet percussion instruments that couldn't get over 45 miles an hour to Ohio for our championships uh, from Alabama. And, like, he said he loved it. He said he was, like, having such a good time, and it was, like, him and Don, like, <laughs> driving to Ohio, pit-stopping to get, like, beer and cheeseburgers uh, uh, to, like, watch their kids, like, do this fun drum thing. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, I really loved it. And it ended up, like... I all this time like I'm getting into comedy also on my own time and movies and like I know who directs and produces things the way like no other kids knew that um and I remember like feeling the tug like man I wish I was doing drama um cause I wanted to do that too uh but you couldn't do both in my school and like all my friends were in band and I, I guess like it still like was the right decision um uh, but I do remember feeling a little pained that like I couldn't also do the plays and stuff because uh, it was like this big, big, big interest I had that nobody else shared. I had no friends that were also into movies. Uh, all my best friends like didn't really care and they would like take my recommendations and I could usually argue like, well, what movie we would go see that night. But like nobody ever like wanted to talk about theme afterwards. <laughs> Which and was I, like what at that time? What what were the ones you loved the most? Oh, Oh man, I, I, I don't remember. High school, what came out when we were high school? So like the big summer stuff would be like, that was like when the Matrix and the new Star Wars movies were coming out and like, um, I don't know, like 
little movies. I don't know. It was it's weird because like when you're in early high school, like what I think of as like discovering real movies was stuff that people have long ago discovered. Like I had to do the crash course in high school of like going back through Tarantino's library and then like from there figuring out what influenced him and finding the old Westerns. Uh, uh, and, um, so yeah, my list of movies that were blowing my mind at the time are the same as everybody else's list of movies. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I remember pointedly, like I do remember fight club, um, which I'm like, (laughs) I don't really watch Fight Club anymore, but I do remember Fight Club being the first movie I saw that broke my brain a little bit, telling me that before that, like all movies were just what my parents would rent. Like all movies were Forrest Gump uh, and like had that arc. Uh, I I truly didn't know that you could do anything else uh, as a ninth grader. And then I saw Fight Club, which was just not a movie I had seen ever before. Um, Uh that wasn't Top Gun or something. Um, and I remember that was like the birth of it. My aunt showed me that movie actually. She was like, you should watch this. I was visiting her and she knew like, she was, she like, I could tell she was like renting me some movies she knew I wasn't allowed to watch. <laughs> and I remember Fight Club breaking me a little bit. Even just like the plot twist in Fight Club was like, whoa, they like lied. They lied about what was going on in the movie. I didn't know you could do that. Uh, and that led to like digging around in Blockbuster and. Uh, the internet to find out like what movies I should be watching. <laughs> how at peace did you feel with your mom's death in high school and how much did you continue to grieve it? Um, I think kids are pretty resilient. I was in eighth grade when that happens and like it's devastating. Like my dad put us all on his lap really. Like he called me and my brother and sister and like before school we were already getting ready for school and he had left to, uh, she died during like uh, r- routine treatment. It wasn't like at home. Uh, so like he came back from the trip to UAB in Birmingham and uh, like early that morning, like called us all in and said like your mommy died last night. And it like in that moment, I remember like there's been few times in my life where like you feel like an impact like that. But uh, yeah, kids, I don't know. Like we're all supposed to lose our parents. And I wonder if we're just like hardwired to recover from it pretty quickly. Um, even though it was like under, you know, it was an old age. Uh, I remember like, even at the end of that day, having very rudimentary little philosophical conversations with my brother, like we were, we, uh, we were sitting on the couch and like, this is hours after getting the news and just being like, man, this is, it's weird. It's weird that she's gone. It had already settled into just being kind of weird. Uh, and he, um, like his immediate response to that was like, man, I wonder when I'm going to have to go back to school. Like, (laughs) and like, and not like, I don't want to go. We were already just sort of thinking about kid practicalities and how we were going to tell our friends. Um, uh, it's weird. It was a weird thing to do, but like, I immediately, like, I was like, well, I'll call people. And my dad was like, what? And I was like, I'll call, I'll call like her friends. Uh, and he was like, okay, yeah. If you want to, if you want to be the person to do that. And like, I called her friends, uh, my mom's friends and like some, and called like one of my, my friends. Oh, I called Mark, this friend I'm talking about. I called my friend Mark and like told his mom, cause like they knew each other from church and stuff, which is weird. It's weird that like I, (laughs) I needed to do that. And I remember some of the people like calling being like, oh, Oh, um, so they were not, <laughs> they were like, why are you t- calling me? Uh, uh, not because they weren't, they weren't interested. Like I could hear them feeling like, why is Tim doing this? He's right. like a child. Like, yes. Uh, uh, it was just this weird thing I felt like I needed to do to cope or something. But yeah, so not, I didn't grieve a whole lot. Like it was very sad. The funeral was very sad. But uh, yeah, kids bounce back from parents dying, I think, pretty pretty quickly. So jumping out of chronological order, how did the deaths of your stepbrother and brother impact you differently? Those are, uh, yeah, those were like, I'm still dealing with it a little bit. Um, that's different. Cause like my brother also in particular, like, um, so Jeremy, my stepbrother, he was like one of the kids I was hanging out with in elementary, junior high, high school. Uh, uh, 
he was like, I skateboarded like in junior high. That was like one of the things I dabbled in desperately trying to make friends <laughs> and wasn't good at it. But Jeremy stuck. Like we ended up remaining friends after skateboarding. Um, and after my mom died, like Jeremy's mother was uh, bringing him over to my house and like interacting with my dad. And like after a year of that or something like uh, 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 they like my dad asked me, like, can I go like on a date with uh, Miss Lisa? <laughs> uh, and I was like, I, I think that was 10th grade, maybe ninth grade. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. Because uh, then like, you know cut to years years later they didn't get married till i was a freshman in college um but so so throughout high school they were seeing each other um and it was great because like my best buddy was like uh also uh our parents were dating and then eventually became my stepbrother which was very cool he wasn't like somebody just placed in our home uh that none of us knew um it was like this really cool thing that he became your brother yeah very much so uh um and, like, we hung out less in high school, uh, um, I think, for, like, a combo of reasons. One, we were into different stuff, uh, uh, again, like people do in, in high school. He was just not in band and wasn't interested in any of that. And we were, like, hanging out with different groups of friends, but also, like, saw each other at home all the time. Uh, so it really did start to feel, like, brotherly, like, even when they were dating. Um, uh, and then... Yeah, then I went off to college and, like, I felt like I ta- I, I feel, I, I guess the thing, like, if anything, if there's anything I'm still, like, extra sad about other than the obvious reasons of, of losing him is, like, when I went to college, like, we just didn't talk a ton because I was gone. Uh, and he was, like, uh, doing trade school uh, uh, to be a welder, I think, uh, uh, which he, like, uh, did really well at it, I think, and, like, uh, uh, graduated and was, like, had a good job lined up. Um, and I was visiting home my senior year, I think, uh, just on a weekend. I randomly decided to drive down, uh, and, yeah, my dad came in the room and said that uh, uh, they were passengers on their way home from a party, uh, uh, and the guy who was driving them was drunk and uh, went off the road, and, and they were killed instantly. Um, uh, and as far as like, I don't know, I don't know really, like, I, I'm not conscious of how that affects my life like day to day. Um, uh, mostly it was just impossibly hard on, on my stepmother, Lisa, who was like really just the most wonderful woman in the world. And, uh, uh, he was her only biological kid. She still very much like calls us her children because she's been with us since I was so young, like 14 or something. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's not an easy thing to, <laughs> uh, to deal with. And so I think it just affected our, our home a little bit. It was very sad. Uh, and, and it was, it was making sure she was taken care of and like that she was feeling love, I guess. Um, uh, because I think we were able to process it a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, my brother Brendan, that's, like, the one that, like, yeah, still I feel like I can feel it a little bit day to day because uh, when I said that, like, nobody... Um, I had nobody to, like, talk about movies and stuff with, like, as far as friends goes, like, he was that person. Like, my brother and I were the movie nerds and, like, comedy nerds and watched every, like, Comedy Central stand-up special and... Uh, he uh, he was only going to do, like, one tour in Afghanistan and I don't think was interested in making a career out of it. And then, like, he was talking to me, like, he hadn't made a decision yet, but, like, he was like, I don't know, maybe I'll come out there and do, like, UCB stuff with you when, I w- when he would, like, call me from Afghanistan. Uh, and we knew each other's references and they were shorthand. It was very, like, twin-like. He was three years younger than me, but we liked all the same stuff. We liked all, like, we read comic books and, like, were, he was really like my best friend in the world. Uh, and um, I was not ready for that at all uh, when I got that call. Cause he was also like done. He was, uh, he had been there for a year. He was coming home in two weeks and then he was never going back. Uh, and he was killed like on his last patrol. There's a, there's a, I mean, there's an article about it in the Atlantic called The Last Patrol about um, like everybody in this unit about to go home and then they get attacked uh he was killed by an ied and like it was this awful firefight 
so I guess like that was, uh, I'm a little surprised I made it through, honestly, because I'd only been in LA for a year and I was just toast at that point. Like I, <laughs> uh, uh, I was already struggling like as everybody does in their first year in LA. And like, then when I flew home, like, and it was just, it was just so devastating. Like the overwhelming sadness, like that there's just not vocabulary for, uh, uh, just oppressive, like from from uh, through every um, section of the family, like people flying down and, and driving up from Florida, and just like this is my great uncle John, uh, my dad's uncle, like very bluntly at the funeral was like, "This is the worst thing that's ever happened to our family <laughs> in any generation," uh, which is like. <coughs> Uh, I think he might be right. Like it was, I, it really blew my, like, it's still like, it's surprising, like how big uh, an effect that death was on everyone. Um, cause he was so like, just wonderful and lovely and kind in the way that I'm not that as kind as he is. Uh, and, um, you know, wanted to find, he, uh, Kyle Bosman reminds me of him a little bit the way they're just, <laughs> like he's just like uh, I don't know it's probably fine for people to like that thing uh, <sighs> that was like his outlook on things if I was complaining about a movie or something he'd be like it's fine like <laughs> let people like what they like he was very just nice and, and, and kind natured um, and so I thinking of having to move back to LA and like struggle and be rejected and uh, uh, try to be funny in the face of millions of people who are funny than funnier than me I felt like at UCB it was just, it seemed impossible like I, I can't I'm very surprised still that like I came back out there's definitely a world where I'm like I, I tapped out I'm not going to get over this one and came back got all my stuff and moved back to like teach high school um uh, but people, like, I, I don't know, like, a thing that helped was just, like, the support I had. Uh, I was on a beta team at UCB at this point, and, like, uh, uh, Eva Anderson was our coach, and she was, like, uh, I, or maybe I wasn't on the team yet, but, like, she was about to put me on the team or something, and she was very nice to me. Uh, and I don't know, like, she, uh, she was, like, very cool to me in a, in a time that, like, I was very sad and bummed out about everything. Um, uh, Adam McKay was like very, uh, McKay, but, uh, was very cool. Um, and like checked in on me to see how I was doing. Cause like we'd, we'd met at this point and we're hanging out a little bit uh, or just seeing each other at the theater. Um, so yeah, just like having people that were sympathetic, uh, helped a lot. Um, yeah. So what are the steps that brought you from doing music in high school out to LA doing comedy. There was kind of like a, a gradient move. Uh, I so I finished college and took the L set and and did good and like was going to go to law school. Uh, and at this point, like I had done a little bit of drama in college, but wasn't part of the drama program and had taken some acting classes. And again, this has always like been there. Like since I was I was making little Batman movies with my mom's video camera when I was nine, um, and it was always just in the back of my brain that like, it would be great to like write and be in movies. Um, but in Alabama, like there's just no access point or like, there's no uh, people who like grew up in maybe uh, cities. Like at some point, like you figure out like, Oh yeah, people can just move to LA after Chicago. Nobody does that in Alabama, anyone at all. Uh, so it took like going all the way up to like taking the LSAT that I was like, wait, am I going to be a lawyer? Like, I don't No Part of me wants this. Like everyone told me I would be good at it. Uh, as far as like parental advice and like my grandparents, uh, saying I would make a good one. Like the family thought I would make a great lawyer. Uh, um, uh, which sounds like an obvious thing for parents to say, but they, they also were like, don't, try to be a doctor like <laughs> they they were specific in what like they thought I would be good at uh, not with those butterfingers I mean I flamed out immediately in my like freshman biology course like I made good grades in high school and then like the moment like I was faced with like not being able to sort of just like bullshit your way through high school like a place where you had to study 
uh, I like tanked my first biology class. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm not going to be pre-med. I'm going to go back to uh, this BA where I get to write essays all day. I know I can knock that out of the park. I know how to make people cry, like teachers cry with my writing in high school. Like, it's... I was picking the thing I was good at, but it was absolutely out of laziness, like, which is weird in retrospect to think about. I was like, well, I'm good at writing, but my motivation wasn't, I'm going to do this because I'm good at writing. I'm going to major in lit and like do creative writing courses. It was, I'm going to take these courses because I know I will do well in them uh, from like a GPA standpoint. It was sort of out of <laughs> laziness, which is weird. I wonder if we're all chasing like what we're good at out of just because it would be too hard to do anything else. Um, but, but comedy writing, you do love. I do. So it's just this kind of creative, like more like prose writing that was more out of, I'm good at this, so I'm doing it for that reason. I also loved that too. I don't know. I don't really know. I didn't know what I was doing in college. College was weird. Like I didn't get a lot out of it, I think. I didn't even like get socially uh corrected the way you're supposed to in high school. Like I was still a shithead to my girlfriend at the time. And like, I didn't learn <laughs> how to be a person, I think until like my first two years in LA. So you ended up moving to LA in 2008? Nine. In 2009. Yeah. I, I graduated, uh, freaked out about going to law school, uh, told my dad, um, Hey, I don't want to do this. I want to go to LA and maybe screenwrite. And he really surprised me by saying, uh, yeah, okay do it now. I mean, like, don't wait. That's great. Uh, uh, he, and not immediately now. He said, he actually said, do wait. He said, come home please for six months and <laughs> save some money because you're going to lose it all immediately. And he was absolutely right. Um, so yes. Uh, so then I moved home, uh, and got a job as a bank teller, uh, which is also like not just saving money to move to LA, but like I was six months from moving eight months, maybe. Um, and that could have gone wrong. I could have not have ended up moving to LA. Like, oh, I know all my friends thought it was like all talk. Like, yeah, sure, whatever. You went to college and then you moved back to the same small town you grew up in. Um, but that bank teller job was the thing that maybe cinched it. Like, it was like, whoa, I can't, I cannot live here anymore. Because uh, in a small town like Alabama Bank, like people are very friendly and open with their bank tellers and will spew whatever racist, horrible thought goes through their minds. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, uh, or, you know, homophobic missive because, like, there's some dude that looks a little gay across the room to this woman cashing her checks and she wants to comment on it. Like, it was it was real despair working there. <laughs> I, uh, I really, like, hated every second of it. Um, and some of the people I worked with were wonderful, but just, like, it was once a day you would be faced with something that really was, like, you heard someone say something really ugly. Um, and I try to like defend my hometown a little bit sometimes, uh, because it was like adjacent to a military base and was a, a melting pot more than other Southern towns. Uh, and I grew up with people born and of the South who were wonderful people. Like they're not all terrible. <laughs> uh, I would say even most of them aren't. Um, but it deserves its reputation. Like it's rough down there. Uh, and people, there are a lot of not great people still like hanging on to this like fantasy of the fifties when everything was better for them. <laughs> uh, and that job, like it was like, okay, I gotta go. And then I lost some money at my station, gave too much money away, like screwed up, which is a fireable offense. And they fired me, um, after working there for a long time, I wasn't quite ready to move. And I ask myself sometimes like, was I going to move? Like, before I lost that job, like, would that job have just turned into my job if I didn't get fired? And, like, when I got fired, like, I drove home, and I was like, hey, um, I'm not working there anymore. I'm going to just, I'm going to go now. I'm going to move, like, in two weeks. Like, and the move to L.A. took two weeks. Like, I got fired, went home, got on Craigslist, and, like, was browsing apartments and just going to, like the cord um and yeah. at the same time this is what's really weird to me and i haven't really figured out while i was doing that i saw the musicians institute was in la uh, which is like this post-grad like uh 
kind of pop music. You learn to go play guitar in the way that will get you employed in the music industry. So like graduates like get the guitarist job on the Katy Perry tour or whatever. Like learn how to be a working musician. Um, I applied to that school as like, I don't know why. Like I, I sent off a bunch of recordings of myself playing guitar and I had gotten pretty good by that point and they got in and called me and were like, hey, we'd really love you to be a part of the school. And I wonder if like all of that was just some sort of fail safe. Like, hey parents, like I'm going out to do this sort of nebulous thing I don't actually know how to do at all, which is screenwrite and like try to do TV or movies and stuff. But also like I did get accepted into this like school that teaches me how to like have a job in the arts. And I don't think anybody cared. Like, I don't know. I got out here and never went to the school. Like <laughs> they, they, they ate my deposit, uh, uh, an application fee. Um, but I ended up finding a roommate on Musicians Institute's uh, roommate finder. Oh, good. <laughs> so I didn't have to do a Craigslist stranger. And that was great because I ended up living with this guitarist for the first like eight months who was so cool. Like this dude, Brandon, who I think is now back in Philly, but like he was going to the school and was such like a cool, chill, like roommate to uh, make that first year in LA a lot easier. I don't even think it was a full year. He was maybe only there for six months. Um, but yeah, and then once I was here, um, yeah, started doing, started going to UCP, like sort of just looking for my way in. So of everybody I know out in LA, you're one of the most strategic people I know, and you've just done LA really well. I feel like you've got an amazing work ethic, you've done the right jobs, you've written what feels like to me pretty prolifically uh, different scripts. Uh, did you come in with that strategy? No. Um, there's definitely people we know like this, but like I, 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 uh, I don't know if this is true. I might just say this very wrong thing. Uh, I, <laughs> I feel like the people who move out here fully cold, like knowing nothing about anything, is I've I've found to be kind of like a minority, um, and that doesn't mean everybody was already set up with an internship out of college or like had a friend that worked somewhere. Like I just feel like most of my friends like had an idea of you know, where you even look for a job maybe when you come here or that knew what a PA was. I was like a dumb idiot, like who drove here, who didn't know anything about anything. Uh, and so, no, <laughs> I had no strategy whatsoever. But I was, I was even as a tiny kid and, and, and then moving out to LA and now, uh, I'm intuitive. I know I'm intuitive for sure. I know I can read how things work pretty well. I think if more so than strategy, certainly more so than talent, I think I have lucked into jobs or done well at jobs because I kind of can read how things are supposed to go. Um, so I moved out here, uh, was in this weird one bedroom apartment with no furniture with a fellow guitar player, uh, immediately went to a temp agency uh, and tempt around a little bit. I worked at City Hall in their tax department and definitely screwed up a lot of city taxes <laughs> because I bullshit my way into that job. I told them that I had accounting experience and I was considering my bank telling accounting experience. And they sat me in this cubicle for three days and told me to like file this, all these numbers and crunch these numbers. And I was truly like, I'm not exaggerating, just like kind of randomly putting things into a computer until I would get caught. <laughs> uh, and I never did. The temp gig ended, and I'm sure two months later, they came across a series of numbers that were completely screwed up <laughs> uh, and yelled at that temp agency. Yeah. Um, I But, like, I knew how to make it look like I was doing <laughs> that work. That's pretty cool. Because, um, uh, like, I just read how, like, it was supposed to look. Um and then I, then the next job I got from that temp agency was a plastic bag factory in Vernon, this like horrible industrial wasteland, like south of downtown. Uh, and I worked there for like six or seven months. Uh, and it was death. Uh, and at that time, when I got that job, I was also working nights at the Palladium in the Wiltern, the, the, the concert venues here. 
And that was kind of cool because I saw every concert that came through LA for almost a year. Um, and had finally like taken my first UCB course. Um, and my first two, I think, I think while I was at the bag factory, I took, uh, I, at that point I might've been an improv two and sketch one. Um, and wasted a lot of time there. Um, and so, yeah, that was very much like, uh, I don't know, like trying to hold an armful of water. Like I was always exhausted and I was like working eight to five during the day and then working until two in the morning at the concert venue. And then if I wasn't at the concert venue, I was like maybe interning at UCB by that point. Or no, I wasn't interning for the first half of the bag factory. I was just taking classes. But yes, some, and then on weekends taking the classes that I could afford. Uh, and then near the tail end of the bag factory gig, that's when I lost my brother. And like I got the call um, and I flew home for that. Uh, and it was actually like the first day I was home in Alabama, like sort of dealing with that, that Lindsay at UCB called me and was like, hey, we wanna um, give you an internship. You were recommended by your teacher. Uh, and I was like, I can't, I, I can, oh, she like asked if I could start the next day. And I was like, I'm here dealing with this. And it's funny to think that I thought I had lost it. Like I, I thought like, oh no, I, this has made, sh now I won't get the internship cause I wasn't available, which is <laughs> yeah. absurd. Like she of course immediately was like, Oh, oh my God. I'm so sorry. Well, we'll see you next month. Like, okay, uh, good. like there, <laughs> I can't believe like a part of my brain in that grief was like, Oh no, I won't get the UCB internship. <laughs> uh, it's embarrassing. Um, so I came back, uh, it was a long trip home, obviously. Uh, and as I left, my dad was like, Hey, you need to quit one of those jobs. Um, you're gonna find out you're gonna three years from now you're gonna be like fuck i moved to la and to work at a bag factory uh <laughs> and he gave me a little bit of money that would like cover me for a couple of months like two or three months which i don't think like was easy for him <laughs> uh and i worked at the bag factory a little longer and then quit yeah to to focus on what i was focusing on i had the ucb internship i was starting to read that I was somewhat like liked there a little bit. People were responding to my stuff, especially in sketch. Like we could talk for an hour just about that. Like the realization of like, whoa, I should be do really focusing on the sketch side of things. Um, uh, uh, after like struggling with improv for a little bit. Um, so yeah, quit the job and then uh, there's this dude, Mike Rosenstein, who was hanging out at Comedy Death Ray. Um, and he was just always there every Tuesday that I internshiped at, or interned on. And I asked him, like, I don't remember what I asked. It was something along the lines of, like, what's your deal? <laughs> like, what do you do? Uh, and um, he said he worked at uh, Red Hour, for, uh, which is Ben Stiller's company. And I asked if there were, like, jobs there, because I was definitely looking. Like, now I was off, and I, I was absolutely terrified of, like, blowing through this little cushion my dad gave me to find the right job and then not finding it. Like, I had no, I, I was like, I'll kill myself. I can't, like, <laughs> I can't waste this opportunity he just gave me. Um, and he was like, no jobs, there's internships, they're not paid. Um, and... So I took it, I, I went in to interview, or he didn't give it to me. He said I could come in and interview and I interviewed with this guy, Robin Mabrito, who I'm still like buddies with, uh, who was like running their intern at the time. Uh, and I got it. And I was still working at the concert venue for sure for like, for my night job. Um, and so I worked at Red Hour during the days. And after like two months, I was doing well enough there that they were like, that Mike and I think Robin pushed me on one of, uh, like the dudes that run the company, they were like, you should be his assistant. Um, and I had no assistant experience and I was pretty intimidated by it. And like, he wanted somebody that had like come up through CAA, like he's a big producer. <laughs> uh, but they convinced him to just like hire one of the interns in house. And I was very bad at the job. <laughs> um, and, but he seemed to like me all right. And everybody at Red Hour seemed to like me. Um, and they were giving me like these weird little writing jobs. Um, and like, 
if there was like a some sort of web project they were working on, like I would ask if I could try to write a script for it. Um, yeah, and, I remember you doing something with a trailer. Uh, yeah. While like that you were talking about when we were in Chris Kelly's uh, Sketch Two Hundred One class. Oh wow! I don't think I remembered that we were in Skip Chris's Two Hundred One class together. Yeah. That's very funny. Um, it was like it's you, also me, funny that I talked about it. Allie Horde. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, Allie was so funny in that class. Her sketch about. Um, Red Lobster, uh, and like the game was that like they were just throwing all kinds of things through cascading water in, in Red <laughs> Lobster commercials. Like that's still one of my favorite sketches I've ever read. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So that's that's funny that you remember me mentioning that. Um, yeah. So yeah, they just sort of generally liked me, but also like he was very upfront about the fact that I was bad at my job. And after months and maybe five six months of doing that, he was like you can't be my assistant anymore. Like, you can't forget to tell me people called. Uh, and he was right. I was bad at this job. Um, or, or tell me people called too late. Like, I, I I, was okay at, like, staying organized, but, like, I had no, like, I couldn't read the way the industry was supposed to work. Like, I couldn't read, like, the subtleties of, like, how you accidentally insult someone by, like, not calling them at the right time or something. And I didn't want to know that stuff. It's... It's, it's the part I don't ever want to be super familiar with because it's annoying. <laughs> yeah. Um, you should either be not involved in it or above it. Right. He brought me into his office and said, we need to find you a writer's assistant job. Uh, or that's what you should be doing. And this is where, like, yeah, preparation meets, like, opportunity because my friend Whitney had just decided she was not going to be the writer's assistant for Paul Shear anymore on NTSF on Adult Swim. And uh, I, she asked me if I'd be interested in interviewing. And she brought me in, I think, before uh, to interview, to be a personal assistant over there to the guy who produces all those shows. Uh, and our friend Laura Chin ended up getting that. Um, so, like, I think they'd seen my name before. And she was like, you should come in for the writer's assistant job. And I told Stuart, my boss, I was doing that. And he was like, great, that's what you need. Great, that, now I can fire you. <laughs> uh, which he was going to do anyway. But he, he was like, this is good. Because like, <laughs> I think he, he likes me a little bit. Um, or just wanted to get rid of me, but didn't want to throw me to like the, the gutter. <laughs> no, it sounds like he both really liked you and didn't want you yeah. to maybe he's do just, that job anymore. Maybe he's just not mean. Uh, so I went in and interviewed. And immediately after the interview, I was like, well, I didn't get that at all. Um, cause it was just a weird interview. Like I sat next to John and talked to him about what I wanted to do in life and like that I wanted to write, but it was while they were in the, like it was during shooting of children's and he brought me into village and like the, uh, the person who was directing the episode was clearly like not loving that there was a job interview going on right behind him and like kept like looking back and like. I had to like pick times where I was able to talk, uh, which is not during shooting or, or when they're rolling and not when he's giving direction. Uh, so it was a very stilted, weird interview and yeah. I felt like I completely biffed it. <laughs> um, and I walked upstairs to Whitney uh, and I was like, well, I didn't get that. And Gilly Nassim also worked there at the time. And she was like, and I was like, yeah, that didn't happen. And they were like, oh no, I'm sorry. And then I got a call that the, that Sheer wanted to meet me. Um, that I did okay in the first interview and that Sheer and Curtis Gwynn wanted to talk to me. And so I went to a cafe and met with Paul. Uh, and immediately he was like, oh, yeah, like, oh, you do like UCB stuff because his show, like, f I think I was on Maud at that point and his show, Facebook, like, followed Maud. So, like, he'd seen me in the halls or something and recognized my face. And the interview was so quick. He was like, so yeah, you write sketch and comedy and like we do an 11 minute show on Adult Swim and like you seem to get it. This is great. Uh, we got to meet with some other people, but I love this. Uh, and um, then he hired me and that's like, I think where everything changed. Then I was able to quit the night job. Um, uh, they were super um, uh, dream friendly over there. Like they let us leave for auditions and, <laughs> and UCB writers meetings and stuff. Um, and that's where everything, like everything pivoted right there in 2012 when Paul gave me this job. Um, because then I was the writer's assistant on all their shows, children's hospital and newsreaders. And so my first, like after Red Hour, like my first entertainment job is working for Paul Shear, Rob Corddry, David Wayne. 
Ken Marino. Like, these are people I was obsessed with before yeah. I moved well, here. It feels like a lucky job to have gotten. Absolutely, it was a lucky job. Like, I, that, like, that's the point where, like, I had something to do with it because I successfully interviewed for it, but, like, it's kind of overwhelming sometimes to think about the fact that if that job didn't come along right then, like, none of this could have happened. Writer's assistant jobs are hard to get, uh, from what I understand. And, like, I sort of, like, got lucky and, and, and was recommended to the right one. Um, who knows what I'd be struggling, <laughs> toiling away at um, if I didn't get that one. I think I like to think I would have found one because I was pursuing. I was like asking people like, hey, who's got writer's job assistant? They're like, where can you get a writer's assistant? How do you get a writer's assistant job? I guess I just got to skip the writer's PA portion. Yeah. I think if it wasn't that, it would have been something else. Yeah. Um, and if it wasn't another writer's assistant job, you would have found a different way to do it. Right. Um, because I had friends who were pursuing the same thing. Like one of my best buddies out here, Howie Kramer, was also like really hustling for that writer's assistant position, uh, and he managed to like get into Paramount and was a writer's PA and then assistant on Community. Uh, and um, yeah, like just looking back, I was like, man, yeah, I bet me and Howie would have like traded a job at some point or something. He was like also like always kind of looking out and wanted to know like he's 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 always been like the dude who's like checking in and saying like what are you writing on like uh or what are you working on um i feel like i might have stumbled in to something like via him maybe because uh, he was also like uh yeah just like a very driven like i have to get this kind of job because that's going to serve what i want to do out here for a while, I was trying to feel out how much of a gamble that whole writer's assistant thing was because I saw friends who were doing it and would get stuck in it for, like, years. Um, but you were, like, an example of that thing working really well. Because um, how did it end up... Because you went from being a writer's assistant eventually to being staffed on newsreaders. Yeah. How did that happen? Uh, it's not c common, I know, because there were writer's assistants before me that didn't end up doing that. Um, and I think it's generally encouraged anyway. Like, I feel like that's on purpose. Like, I feel like they want you to writer's assist and then outside of that, get your own writer's job. I don't, I don't know. I don't really know how much promotion there is from writer's assistant to writer, but I think it's uncommon. Um, and it was, I don't know. I was just, I knew how to read it. Like, I, I think I, I, in the room, like, I knew when they didn't want to hear from me. I know they don't want, like, you don't, I don't know, you don't want to be too vocal and, like, distracting from the actual writers who are trying to crack a story or something uh, and just look for lulls in the room and then throw something out. And, like, my batting average was okay. Like, those lulls where I would throw something out, like, might get a laugh. And then they would put that note card on the board and then it would wind up in an episode and then... You do that enough, and I presume maybe that uh, somebody on my first season of assisting on newsreaders was like, "Hey, there's a um, there's enough of those pitches that it's noteworthy, maybe that I got in." Uh, but also making it very clear, you want to project like that you're not content. I think, if you're a writer's assistant. I think you want people to know that outside of that job, I was also writing features and, like, uh, sending my stuff out to people to, like, try and get representation. And, like, they... I, I think I got promoted because they... I don't know. I don't know, really. Well, I think... Didn't... I, I hope... I hope... I would like to think that they saw, like, well, Tim's going to get something anyway. Uh, wasn't it that you had a script that was like kind of going viral, like a short script you had written uh, that like a lot of people were like kind of passing around. Yeah. I had, I had written something with another person. Uh, 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 we sort of collaborated on, on an idea and then I, I wrote a, the full like script of it based on like what we had talked about. Um, but that had sat around for years. I hadn't done anything with it. I, I still sort of considered it their project because they sort of came to me and wanted help with cracking this idea of theirs. Um, so yes, a little bit before they finally called me, or not finally, before a little bit before they called me for newsreaders, um, uh, my friend Heather, uh, who was also on a mod team at UCB, had asked me to just like 
she wanted to read some stuff I'd written. Uh, she asked me at her birthday party. And yeah, uh, I had some samples. I had a pilot. I had this short script that I had written with this other, that I had collaborated with with this other person. Um, and I, I sent those to her as just reading samples. Um, and she sent it off to a manager that she knew. And the manager really liked him, my current manager, Audrey. Uh, and she really loved uh, uh, the short and thought the pilot was super funny. I wrote like this Adult Swimmy kind of wrestling pilot that you've read. Um, and so she was like, I would love to r represent you. Um, and so then I had a manager because like the right person had passed my, my material to a manager. Uh, and um, so then like she sent my samples to a couple of people and then sort of out of my control a little bit in a way that like made me really uncomfortable and scared a little bit. Like my stuff just kind of got spread all around. Uh, and a lot of people responded um, uh, uh, to the samples, I guess. And then I got newsreaders. And then, based on my uh, uh, samples that I'd given Audrey, uh, the agents like were interested in me um, at like the big like agencies, which was like crazy and weird. And like it all happened in two months. Like I went from being a, a UCB mod writer and a writer's assistant on the show to like, they, they, I think my boss, Jim Margolis, like called me and offered me the newsreader's job, like two days before I interviewed at CAA and WME or, or met with them, I should yeah. say. Uh, and so then like in seven days, I, I now was staffed on a show and had like heavy, what I perceived as like heavy hitter agents and a manager who all seemed to like me. And I was so <laughs> scared because <laughs> like, I didn't have that much material. Um, the pilot was like this very expensive, like cartoon that like would be a long shot. The short was not mine to do anything with. Uh, it was like, it was, uh, I had collaborated on that short and it was not mine to make. Um, so I really like, I had this feature I was working on that like I really believed in, but like now I had the reps and realized that I didn't have any material to back it up. And I thought I had a lot of material before that point. And now I realized like, oh, I don't really have anything sellable. Like we could try to make this adult swim pilot happen, but like I have to start writing now. And so if you see any work ethic in me, which I'm very skeptical about, like it all happened in that moment. Like it was birthed there where I was like, I have to write, 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 write. Uh, Cause my sketch packet is only gonna do so much. Like there's only X amount of job interviews you can get out of a sketch packet. And so that's where I was like, all right, time to write some movies and, and, and another pilot and um, uh, began working on that at the same time that I was, yeah, staffed on my first show. That experience was wonderful and not scary at all. Uh, that ruled, I was like, now, like, my boss was, like, up here. Oh, man, it was so great. Like, that, and it was, like, a little show on Adult Swim where you were allowed to be super free and goofy and pitch any kind of story you wanted to do. Uh, it was awesome. And because of your experience as a writer's assistant and being in the room at New Money, like, just being in a writer's room felt very comfortable to you? Um, um, I wouldn't say that I was super comfortable. I was intimidated because the other writers on Newsreaders were uh, kind of, like... They were all older than me. One of them was like the dude you call in to like, you want that guy on your first season of, of everything, like this, this old standby TV writer. There was a, some stand-ups. Uh, um, I was very, I was so, I mean, no question, I was the green one in the room. This was, I was the only one doing his first job. Yeah. And so I was definitely intimidated. And um, also like some of the other guys were, just uh, better at pitching than I was at this point. Like they could like, all right, what about this? And then they had nine pitches to go and were right. very vocal in the room. And I was like, oh, I could feel myself like being not vocal enough. And I was like, I got to get in here. I got to get in here. I got to bring in some better ideas. Um, and it, it ended up being fine. I, I ended up getting like four or five segments in the season. Um, uh, it's a fake 60 minutes show. So like each, each episode has two like fake 60 minute segments. Uh, and I got like five in, which was a pretty good ratio for that room uh, and felt fine at the end of it. But 
I, I would not say I rolled in there very confident based on my new money experience, which is like you're sitting on a couch with your six buddies and the, the stakes are, you have to put on a good mod show, but the stakes are very, uh, the professional stakes are low. Like as long as you're bringing in some good sketches, you're fine. Whereas like in, in that job, I was like, well, if I'm not funny for like a week, the, like I'm dead. Like I'll never get, I'll, I won't get hired back. I can not be funny for a week on new money. <laughs> I yeah. can bring in a bad sketch and fix it next week. I can't do that at, at, at in TV. Uh, we we're going. We've we've really bounced around in chronological order all throughout mm-hmm. this episode. But uh, can you talk a little bit about the experience of being on new money? Um, to me, like you're the person who of everybody on the team, I think who's like the biggest fan of the team. <laughs> Um, and there's a lot of fans of the team on the team, but like you seem like you love that team. I'm a little obsessed with us. Um, I think we're the best for sure. (laughs) Uh, uh, and I've talked to definite, well, I've talked to all of you about it, but like, yeah, I think I've talked at length to Mary, uh, Holland, one of our team members about like, they really like, I really think like we were, were lightning in a bottle a little bit. Like, our weird energy matches in a very specific way. Uh, there's a... the, the um, I think Nephew does as well. Like, that's another mod team where I'm like, you guys were meant to be together. Uh, I think we were meant to be together. Like, I've coached teams full of great people who did not seem meant to be together. Uh, where, like, just it didn't gel. Um, did, did you guys instantly... Because I was not on the team for the first year. Yeah. Was it... Instant, uh, what's the word? No, I think, yeah, we all had to like get to know each other, and I feel like uh, our first couple of shows, like, I think they're good shows with great sketches, but it feels a little sort of uh, generic's not the right word, but like, oh, yeah, a mod night. So there's five sketches or six sketches. Um, uh, I, yeah, I really like. It just slowly came out like, man, after three months of like working with Kyle, like you realize like, oh man, this guy's brain works completely differently than everyone else's. And Aaron has this like, it infuriates me, his his genius for like, just sketch in general. Like he's the dude with the encyclopedia brain and can name every sketch on every show that's ever been and like just speaks sketch in the way that I don't, I truly don't know anyone else does at the theater, teacher or otherwise. Like he, he knows, like, I don't know. He has, (laughs) and he doesn't care about it. It seems he's just like, yeah, whatever. I write some sketches. He didn't really care about being on a mod team. He, I think he, he like auditioned on a whim and got it and was like, all right, I guess I'll do this. Uh, And yeah, our actors, like they're, they have this shorthand with one another that like, blows my mind sometimes like they'll make outright wrong choices I feel like on paper that just destroy on mod night because they all clearly like love each other and uh it's a group mind yeah I love us I I really think like we have this weird special energy that nobody else has um that yeah I think I (laughs) I would agree that I'm the one who cares the most about this I don't think anybody else like maybe even perceives it um and I would say like it grows too. Like, I don't know that I would have been this effusive and like uh, starry eyed about new money even two years in. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's really just even this last year because all of us are starting to be successful, like a huge, huge percentage of new money is like working professionally at this point and like being paid to work on movies and TV and, uh, and um, some of us have gone on to like uh, uh, great, great shows. Uh, and just like the confidence that comes with that like you can see that like now now new money like shows up to practice really ready to like play and improvise and explore and just like this is the fun outside of work Um, coming to a head like at that play we did last December like that play like really moved me in a way I was like oh my god we this are, is a Christmas play yeah like we are really something special I don't know that this play exists from any other team uh, it was like 
I don't know. I don't. I I don't like like drawing other like art form comparisons, but it really was like watching our watching us like play music. <laughs> uh, um, our actors just so comfortable and with being weird and and you know, improvising off the script that like you, me, and Aaron wrote over like eight hours until five in the morning the night before because I'll like remember that forever. Just like my my story structure brain like getting hung up at the end and like we could have been out of that room like two hours early and it was you <laughs> I regret it like I feel bad but it was like I was furious not furious I was really hung up on like our play not paying off in the end we had set up these like runners all throughout that I wanted to dovetail and p pay off and it was four in the morning and we were so exhausted and like we had a script due and we were just like, let's just do something goofy. Let's like not pay it off. And the joke will be that it doesn't like, or we'll just open some weird presents at the end of this Christmas play. And I was like, no, it has to dovetail. It has to pay. And you in particular were like pitching all kinds of options for it. And I was like, you know, that's wrong. Like, right. And I feel like I was the one, like, I don't, I, I feel like I was throwing such a wrench in it, but then like you did crack it. Like you did find the perfect payoff for the play that did incorporate everything that came before. And I immediately stopped feeling bad about being such a, a wrench. Like, I was like, oh my God, see, oh. Like, even if I was the only one that perceived it, I was like, this was worth it. Uh, this is the wrestling of Apollo and Dionysus. Yes, like, I was, I was like, that was worth the overnight thing because now our play, like, has a great payoff joke at the end. One joke. Like, uh, that like ties things up with a bow. Um, and I'm still like that, but I took that from getting to watch writer's rooms, uh, as you know, um, on children's hospital. Like I've watched Wayne and Cordry just like not leave until they crack a thing. Um, and I liked it. I didn't think that was annoying. I was like, this is what you want to strive for. You want to not be happy until it's, when it's right, everybody knows it's right. Yeah. When that room like cracked something, they were like, we did it. All right, great. Put that on the board. We finally did it. Uh, and that's how I felt on like that new money play. I was wow. like, yeah, we did it. So in recent months, you worked on the show Filthy Sexy Teens mm -hmm. as a staff writer. That was your second job that you were staffed on. Yeah. Um, you've been writing a bunch of different uh, screenplays for films. How much of the time now do you still feel scared um, and in over your head? Uh, I, I'm not over the impending doom feeling. I do feel like it could all come crashing down at any moment. What would that look like? I guess, yeah, like losing your reps because um, you haven't booked worked in a while. Like, I don't know what would, I truly have no idea what that would look like. If I don't have representation anymore, like, you're, what do you do? You can't go on any general meetings anymore. You can't meet on movies. Like, nobody's reaching out to you. Like, you have no access to anything. I would just be teaching at UCB, uh, which I love, but, like, uh, I hope no one is offended that that's, like, not what I want to do forever. Uh, yeah. Uh, or I guess, like, if we're really, like, daydreaming, like, even a movie, I get my first movie made, and it's, like, bad. Not even just bombs, but like, that's a possibility too. You can you can make a movie that you think is working and then it doesn't do well. I feel like you can bounce back and write another movie after that on a smaller scale. But like, I'm capable of making bad things. I write bad sketches all the time. Like, what if this movie I'm working on now that like I want to shoot independently, like back home in Alabama, like what if I pour my soul into a movie about the impermanence of relationships and dying or, or getting over somebody dying and it's shitty. I've seen bad movies that I know they made thinking we're saying something important with this. Uh, I've seen people try really hard and make a bad movie and I'm capable of that. And that would, that, that's so, that would be such a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> how, how confident do you feel about getting staffed again on like, do you just on show to show? Um, I'm, it's pretty sporadic. Newsreaders didn't flow right into filthy, sexy teens. Uh, they, 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 uh, they, they're just not, I'm not needed that way at Adult Swim. And, uh, 
uh, the shows are spaced too far apart to like rely on that. It's always like a wonderful surprise when they call me and say like, hey, we want you to staff on Sil- Filthy Sexy Teens. Um, uh, which is why I've really been putting all my effort into feature stuff. Cause like I can feel that slow crawl working. I can feel my, like I've, I mean, man, like I got to sit in a room and like give my pitch for like a comic book property. Like I never thought I'd get there. I, I was like, oh my God, like I'm really pitching right now. Like on one of my favorite comic books of all time. Like I never thought I'd get to that point. And the fact that I'm, you know, that didn't happen, but like, I'm getting to do that, which is cool. Um, uh, and I, I want to, f- I want to push for that because staffing just, um, I haven't regularly staffed. It's not like that job hasn't happened. I haven't gotten into that system, uh, yet, uh, regularly. I think my two pilots are fine. I don't know that I would staff me either. Like, I don't know. I struggle a little bit with like trying to craft what a network sitcom looks like. Um, and I love writing spec movies so um i'm not that confident like if uh if adult swim like has another thing that they think i'd be good for they'll probably call me the abominable guys who make all the shows i've worked on the live action adult swim stuff uh if there's another season of filthy sexy teens i bet they'll call me and say like hey come work on this um so there there is probably future work with that production company uh but i'm not that confident i'm gonna be regularly staffing on like tbs shows until um, until I get one and, and have to prove myself in that kind of room because Adult Swim's different. I it's, only ask because I think this will be fun audio to listen to uh, in the what I expect you know five years from now when you're being staffed all the time. That, that's very nice. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Because I also yeah I also worry like about proving myself in that network room. Adult Swim shows I've worked on are like four guys around a table like it's the extension from of UCB. It absolutely is. Like it's it felt like such a natural progression. The stakes are higher, I have to be funny, but like it's still like friends. All those shows are like four buddies like get to make an 11 minute show. Uh, and I know it's very different in the the even more real world of cable staffing and then network staffing and I don't know. I secretly want to just like get off that sinking ship immediately anyway. <laughs> I want to be successful at movies and if I get to write on TV like I want it to be on Netflix uh, like I just want in there now yeah. I don't, I don't want to I don't know I'll take whatever job but I'm not aiming very hard for uh, whatever ABC sitcom calls as much as I would take that in a heartbeat and try very hard so what does your non-humble dream for what five years from now looks like look like I don't know um I would love to have had gotten a movie made in five years. Uh, I'm working on a very big one right now that I wrote on spec, like as an example of like, hey, I could write a big adventure movie. Uh, And so I wrote it truly, like just on spec, um, and people liked it, and it got sent around, uh, and some people picked it up to produce it, uh, and I have no idea what the future of that is, um, but that would be very cool. But that's like crazy pie in the sky. Like that movie doesn't have any established superheroes in it. It's like, it's not the kind of thing people are itching to spend a lot of money on, uh, which is non pre existing (laughs) intellectual property or whatever. There's no SpongeBob in it. Um, (laughs) Oh, you should probably put SpongeBob in it. I should put SpongeBob in it. Uh, But then also, like on the other side, there's this very tiny thing. I think I could move a crew out to Alabama for a month and shoot my tiny um, skeleton twinsy kind of movie. I would love to get that one made in five years. Like, I don't know how long it'll take. That one's going to be totally self-financed, I think. So that one's just like, I have to get a different job that will let me pay for this movie I want to make. So getting a movie made might be nice. I would love to like I'd love to have staffed some more in five years. I do love like writing on TV. Um, I don't know. It doesn't sound very. I get that sounds enormous to me. I don't know if that's non non humbly enough for you. It also seems like it also seems like possibly attainable. Uh, oh, it definitely seems non humbly because these seem like giant dreams. That, yeah, like are the like I, I, none of those things. It's very likely none of those things will happen in five years. Um, 
It's, my, it's amazing that they're plausible. Yeah, yeah. The fact that like I find myself like pitching on like, like yeah, I guess I've got a take on like that old cartoon from when we were kids. Like the fact that I get to do one of those every six months, like feels like I'm still winning a little bit. Like or, or that I'm not winning, but like that I'm still making progress. Uh, I haven't gone backwards yet. Uh, and that, that'll happen at some point. And I'm nervous about how backwards it'll be, but like everyone goes backwards at some point. And, um, I'm getting a little scared of how, uh, <laughs> how long it's been since a true step back. Um, I think all my real five-year goals is like not work related. Like I want to get a band together. I haven't played music in a long time. That's what I really want to do in five years. I want to like get married. Uh, it's all that stuff. So, hypothetical question. Friends of your family back in Alabama, their 23-year-old daughter is moving out to L.A., and uh, they ask you to, like, sit down with her and give her advice. Uh, if you could give her, like, one big piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, community, immediately. Like, uh, we lucked out with UCB, but I feel like there's still that community with people who are taking acting classes. I think, yeah, uh, first thing you spend money on after you've established that you can like afford rent and stuff is start taking any kind of class anywhere. And you are, you are paying for the friends you're going to make. Like just, uh, we surprisingly didn't talk about it all that much, but everything came out of UCB. Every single opportunity, everything came from there. That's where I asked the guy for the internship. The the woman who, uh, Whitney, telling me that like this writer's assistant job is open. We only know each other through UCB stuff. And uh, um, like that community was everything. Just get, get to a place where you can watch people make it. Uh, when we started at this theater, we watched the people who were breaking out then who are five years older than us like break out and you have it in front of you like you have all the million different paths you can take to break out uh they're all so different but like all of our friends that are working on things now um we can trace it back to where we were all like in one-on-one together um so do that with acting class if it's not comedy that you're chasing after uh uh just yeah god find a community immediately um, and pay attention. I don't know. Does that sound condescending? Like, just pay attention. I feel that some of, I, there's, I, I feel like people don't pay attention sometimes. They're like, hey, how did you get that? And it's like, you could have gotten that. You, why aren't you writing? Like, how'd you get that job? Well, I showed him my samples. Um, do you want me to pass anything along? No, I haven't really like written a pilot yet. And they've been here for five years. What are you doing, man? Like, pay attention. Like, uh, yeah. My my advice is to find a community and be prepared for the opportunity, which is old advice in every book about moving to LA. That's spot on. Like, so you're gonna, you may or may not get lucky. I got lucky. Uh, someone may or may not just cold, unsolicited ask you for a sample. You you better have it. Like, oh my God, you better have that sample. Like you should have already written something if you haven't written something. Uh, cause somebody's going to say like, what have you written at some point and be ready for that. You'll feel so dumb if you haven't. And I did like when I was, you know, my first two years in LA, like first time, just a friend was like, what do you have? He could, that person couldn't have done anything for me. But the first time I was asked, what have you written? And I said nothing. I felt stupid immediately, and I tried to fix that. That's good advice. Um, well, Tim, <laughs> in conclusion, uh, I'm really glad you're a person in my life. Thanks, Ben. Uh, yes, I, I appreciate, I have a real appreciation for our relationship. Yeah, I just like you a lot, and I'm glad you're a person that I know. So thank you for doing this with me. There are a few people I uh, like to uh, talk about or bitch about or just like in general discuss story with uh, and the process uh, than you because you're also actively doing it a lot. Uh, often with a lot of bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no. please just hear my pitch for Back to the Future 
three as I would have done it one more time. No, I can't. <laughs> okay. You just outed me as being a huge fan of what they did with Back to the Future 3, <laughs> which no one agrees with. <laughs> uh, thanks again for coming on the show. I rode in a cluttered room with a ceiling low. So if I stand too straight or I stand too tall, I bump my head. So, what'd you think? That was my interview with big Back to the Future 3 fan, Tim Neenan. If you'd like to see some Tim Neenan sketches live, you should come out to the next New Money show. They happen the second Wednesday of every month. Again, I hope you'll consider subscribing to On the Cusp, and it would mean a lot to me if you'd consider reviewing the show on iTunes. I really mean that. When people rate or review the show, it means a lot to me. Special thanks to Casey Trela and the band Hi Ho Silvero for all the music in this episode, to my sound editor, Joe Burge, and to my producer, Cece, I can has Alexa play some good music, Pierce. This has been On the Cusp. That's your outro music.